Temple Sinai's Adult Education Committee is thrilled to welcome you to the 2023 Latka Humantashen debate. Yes, the third fundamental of Jewish culture, food. This debate tradition dates back centuries to 1946, in fact, at the University of Chicago, where scholars dug deep to discover through erudition, the answer to one of our most important questions, which is the quintessential Jewish food, the lovely latka or the words fail me, humantashen. Tonight, it is my great honor to introduce Mr. Keith Greer, Mr. Keith Greer, past president of Temple Sinai, a man well-versed in moderating conflict between persons of all ages from toddlers, teens, and troublesome adults in matters almost as important as this one, which we hope to resolve tonight. So please, Give a zealous Zoom welcome to Keith Greer and our great debate team. Thank you, Marlene, and welcome everybody. I'm gonna start with a few comments of my own on what is ahead for us this evening, uh, and then turn it over to our, uh, our esteemed guests. So let me share my screen. There we go. In honor of the joyous holiday of Purim, I welcome you to the 2023 Temple Sinai Latka Hamantash debate. The merits and drawbacks of these two beloved and yet fundamentally different Jewish delicacies, as Marlene shared, has been passionately expounded upon since the first Latka Hamantash debate held in 1946. Absurd, celebratory, funny, and deeply serious, this debate was born when Rabbi Maurice Pekarski, director of the University of Chicago Hillel, along with historian Louis Gottschalk and anthropologist Saul Tax, decided to do something as a morale booster for Jewish students who were uncomfortable with the onslaught of Christmas celebrations on campus and concerned about where the intersection between Jewish tradition and secular academia is so great, Latka Hamantas debate came into being. For more than seven decades, a war has been waged and has raged within the heart of almost every Jewish human on earth. A debate so profound, it has attracted and distracted the great minds on earth. Nobel laureates, MacArthur Genius Grant recipients, university presidents, scholars, philosophers, poets, cantors, and clarinetists. It's a question essential to the joys and tribulations of the Jewish existence, a question that remains the most enduring in human history, external and never decided. This question has been furiously examined and debated throughout the hallowed halls of the world's finest institutions of higher learning, among global leaders and within the shadowy underground centers of power. A quote from Howard Aronson from the University of Chicago, 1969. The only thing that appears to be universally relevant today is the relevancy of demonstrating relevancy of something which we know deep down inside to be totally irrelevant. <laughs> Making the irrelevant relevant is an ability that is firmly ingrained in the Jewish tradition. Other debates, of a similar ilk come and go. Coke versus Pepsi, French fries versus tater tots, hot dogs versus hamburgers, simplistic in their construction and in the grand scheme of the universe of no importance to humankind. But this debate, one of the greatest examples of our Jewish tradition of making the irrelevant relevant, latkes versus homotash, this debate is one that deserves to rank up there with the disputes between the likes of Einstein and Niels Bohr or Tesla and Edison. The arguments for either Latka or Hamantash are plain and challenge us to think beyond the scope of normalcy. Hamantashen, the triangular filled pastries are the darling of Perm or carnival-like holiday. They symbolize the Jews' deliverance from the ancient Persian tyrant Haman who planned to kill them all. 
The shape of the cookie harks to his hat or maybe his ears. Those siding with Hamantash have been known to point out that in addition to being a tasty holiday treat, they could make a great peer, pair of earrings. <laughs> While those whose feet are firmly planted in the Latka camp have raised the painfully thoughtful question of what Jew in their right mind would make and name a cookie to honor the villain of the story. The late Marvin Mirsky, professor of humanities at the University of Chicago makes a case for the sheer symbolic power of the Hamantaschen. Quote, in the famous chapter 43, entitled The Whiteness of the Whale, Melville confronts us with the fundamental and profound duality of the monstrous creature. Is the whiteness a symbol of virtue and goodness, or is it the emblem of terror and evil? Is the whale a three-dimensional latka, wallowing in its gargantuan and blubbery circularity, bodying forth the benign and virtuous aspect of nature? Or is the whale a gigantic hamantash, capering from its massive triangular head to its tail fins, the incarnating and incarnating the darkness, the malevolence, the evil of the universe? Ahab takes the whale for a hamantash and carries his ship and crew with him to destruction. Latka, oh, sorry, wrong Latka. Latka, the first, the fried potato pancake are essential at Hanukkah when Jews celebrate the ancient rededication of Jerusalem's temple after it was recaptured. A one day supply of holy oil kept the temple's menorah lit for eight dead. Latka's fried in oil symbolize that miracle. Proponents of this carb-filled, greasy example yeah, of culinary yeah. genius have argued that the shape of your standard latka, round and yet filled with cracks and crevices, represents both the circle of life as well as the pitfalls laid before us as we attempt to reach a higher level of consciousness. American historian Bernard Weisberger, arguing for the latka, stated, quote, as anyone who has read Frederick Jackson Turner knows, the seeds of American democratic institutions were planted on the frontier. And as any student of American history knows, the frontier was a place where the simplest and crudest instruments of life had to do double duty. In cookery, the uncomplicated frying pan was the pioneer's first resource. The ax, rifle, and skillet were the weapons in the conquest of the wilderness. And what kind of dish do we make in a frying pan? I assure you, it is not the high price confection that demands an oven, a more complicated piece of engineering, to say nothing of such exotic, un-American and civilized ingredients as prunes or poppy seeds. Let me, include, let me conclude my opening remarks by shedding some light on a final matter of importance. What are Purim and Hanukkah? Now, these relatively minor festivals are interesting in their own right, but to add a layer of insight and understanding, I would like to share a few words from Hal Weitzman, Executive Director for Intellectual Capital at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, during their 70th annual Latka Hamantaschen debate. Professor Weitzman summarized the significance of these two holidays by sharing a beautiful divar from Rav Zalman Menachem Tuva Zindel of blessed memory. Rav Zalman was an 18th century luminary from the Polish shtetl of Glitz. As was the tradition of the day, learned dignitaries were known by an acronym based on the letters of their name. Thus, Rav Zalman Menachem Tuvia Zindel, as we highlight the letters R Z M T Z, was known far and wide as the Razmataz of Glitz. In his famous book of Torah, Lasim al Haglitz, which translates in English to putting on the glitz, Rav Zalman shared a lengthy and deeply personal perspective that continues to this day to be the answer that all other Jewish scholars utilize whenever asked to respond to this complex and multi layered question. When asked by his students, Rav Zalman, what are Purim and Hanukkah? The beloved and respected Rav would look up as if he was just touched by the hand of God and simply state, 
Purim is the Jewish Halloween and Hanukkah is the Jewish Christmas. And while Jewish texts are filled with interpretations of the interpretations of this particular devar by Rav Zalman, there's one aspect of this long Latka Hamantash divide that we know to be true. When my grandson, Remy and Atlas, come to me in the near future and ask, Papa, why are the Jewish people after 75 years still arguing about which is better, the Latka or the Hamantash? I will be able to share with them what our rabbinic sages have known to be true over the millennia. People of the Jewish faith have no choice but to fully and with great passion engage in two of our most cherished activities, some might even say obsessions, that deeply spiritual combination of arguing and food. So it is my pleasure to introduce our debate luminaries for the evening. First, representing Team Latka, Dr. Melissa Bissonette is an associate professor at St. John Fisher University, where she teaches in English literature and legal studies. She is also a founding member of the women's a cappella group, The Boom Chicks. She is widely known as Lizzie's mom or in temple chorus circles, as Vince's, Vince's wife. Debating alongside Dr. Bissonette, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joshua Faber. Dr. Faber is professor and head of the School of Mathematical Sciences at RIT. At Sinai, he's the former VP of Education, Layla and Charlie's dad, Sheva's husband, and the son or son-in-law of numerous temple members. He sometimes tries to sing, but he can't. Without further ado, Dr. Bissonette, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, good evening to all. I stand before you to present the argument that the Latka is better than the Hamatashin. Both treats have long histories and partisans, and I mean no disrespect to any Hamantashians in the audience. Also, as a pacifist, I want to acknowledge that both treats are tied to holidays of military dominance. Oh no. <laughs> There we go. Um, uh, even if only by the very loosest of associations. And I ask that all of us Latkeites and Hamantashians alike pour out a drop of wine in remembrance and as a promise of peace. Thank you. My, argue, oops, my argument has two parts. First, I will address the literary historical importance of the Latke. And secondly, the social justice ramifications of the circular edible. It is a little known fact that the Latka entered the English language early in the 17th century when a committee of scholars translated the Bible into what would become the King James Version. Among them, a young Murano scholar, Simon Ben Simon, addressed the notably thorny translation problem of bread. In Exodus, we read that the children of Israel first see manna. When they first see it, they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Of course, we know that the Israelites knew what bread was because that's exactly what they were doing when they had to leave Egypt. They were making bread. So this particular translation is nonsense. Instead, uh -huh. Simon Ben Simon suggested that the miraculous gift of God was instead a latka. He prepared latkas for his colleagues who agreed that they were divinely ordained, but rejected the proposed translation. However, we do begin finding the Latka imprint shortly after, giving some credence to this tale. Uh, according to Google Ngram, you can see it's a pretty steady use of the term, some strange spike in 1650, but otherwise relatively steady use in English. Latkas appear in literature throughout the last several centuries, having a place at many a fictional banquet table 
far too many for discussion here. I wish to focus on the most recent and fascinating literary latkes by the Jewish writers Gertrude Stein and Franz Kafka. Gertrude Stein, who called her partner Alice my little latka in private, wrote what is possibly the most profound of the many odes to the food in her poem, Bubble. It is short enough to include here in full. Well, Bubble well. mash the, for without flour, flower, flower, the flower flowering is bubble, the whole and its parts, part. The heart-wrenching conclusion evokes the catastrophe of that rare failed latka, just not able to hold it together, drifting from its fellows in a sea of smoking oil. Franz Kafka wrote the little known and enigmatic short story L in 1914. In his private letters, Kafka relates an argument with his father over whether latkes were central to a true understanding of Hanukkah or a secular attempt to find meaning in an utterly meaningless world. Kafka took both sides in his letter, but the debate shed some light on the narrative. In this story, the moon as a symbol for the latka transforms into a ravenous wolf as a symbol for the Maccabees, which poses a riddle to an old man Kafka's father, who is a symbol, of course, for the oil. Scholars have debated Kafka's intent, some arguing that this allegory is a howl of pacifism, others that it is the cipher to secret messages endlessly sent and never received, both oil and meaninglessness, both father and wolf, and the latka at the center of it all. Lot, uh, Kafka's heir, of course, is Lemony Snicket and his Latka, oops, no, who wouldn't stop screaming. Ah, it yells over and over, year after year, the embodiment of the Jews' eternal existential crisis. Ah, indeed. I now turn to issues of social justice. The Latka stands for or supports movements for food equity, labor, feminism, and diversity. First, food equity. For this, I must return to the historical record to the birth of the Latka in the form we now recognize. Around the year 1300, Rabbi Colonimus Ben Colonimus in Italy, a mystic and a wealthy man, spent a day meditating on the words of Rabbi Akiva for should not for should not the nourishment go round and realized that um, realized that idea in giving the latka a circular shape, which would also symbolize equality of access with no beginning and no end. Anecdotal evidence suggests that the rabbi devoted the rest of his life to the task of promoting latka food banks but as we know, latkes cannot be preserved being too delicious to last that long. The rabbi's round latka was not yet primarily potato based. That innovation came in the middle of the 19th century when a series of crop failures in Poland and Ukraine led to the increased reliance on potatoes. An unnamed cantor in Ukraine urged all Jews in solidarity with the hungry to spread the popularity of the potato pancake. Since then, the latka has been a symbol of the resilience of the laboring classes in every country where a Jew can be found. Rabbi Kalonymus's dream was finally fulfilled. One cannot help but wonder about the rabbi's wife who likely did the actual frying and indeed to support the latka is to support feminism. We all know of the latka's association with the Maccabees, but earlier in our history, Hanukkah and the delicious disc were also associated with the apocryphal story of Judith, whose own guerrilla actions led to the defeat of the Assyrians. The book of Judith tells a strange and bloody tale, morally questionable, involving seduction, drunkenness, and appalling violence, but these are not the reasons for her removal from the Tanakh. No, that erasure of her from the record can only be understood as a sexist move by the entrenched establishment. I hear echoes of Vashti suggesting 
the uh, suggesting the appropriateness of this particular celebration of Alatka now at Purim. As with the orange on the Seder plate, as with the cup of Miriam, in celebrating the Latka, we celebrate the women erased from history. Last, the modern Latka is not the white male Latka of the past. The Jerusalem Post lists sweet potato, zucchini, and beets as alternatives to potato, while other authorities suggest fennel, rutabaga, celery root, parsnips, turnips, carrots, cabbage, and more. We cannot yet say that the Latka universe is truly welcoming to all vegetables, but we know we are on that road and will not stop learning until we get there. Gentle folk, I wish to remind you of one thing as I cede the floor to my opponent. No child ever ran toward a plate of fresh latkes and found them dry, nor was any ever deceived into thinking perhaps that was chocolate in the middle, only to find it prune. No, my friends, no child ever left a plate of latkes disappointed. Dr. Bissonette, I would like to thank you for allowing me to work through my childhood trauma of believing that that was chocolate inside the homentaschen and it wasn't. I haven't thought about that in a long time. I, I felt a certain relief uh, as you shared that. Thank you very much. Dr. Faber, the floor is yours. So I have to say it's a little unfair that my daughter just gave a standing ovation to my opponent. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, I'd like to argue on behalf of uh, Hamantaschen and the Jewish human experience. Um, as, as Keith mentioned, I'm in the, the math department, so it seemed only appropriate um, to begin with a, a geometric approach um, to Hamantaschen. Let's let H be a Hamantaschen with side lengths A, B, and C and interior angles alpha, beta, gamma. Using the law of cosines, we may conclude that, well, Honestly, nothing. No one actually remembers the law of cosines. Even I have to struggle to remember it. Now, I want to argue something completely. I want to talk about Hamantaschen, the symbol at, at the holiday of Purim, um, and basically try to explain how Hamantaschen basically capture uh, the, the entirety of the human experience in, in one delightful cookie. Um, Let's take a look at Hamantaschen themselves uh, inside of a sweet, but you know, fairly bland exterior, uh, occasionally dry, admittedly, but not if they're cooked right. Uh, we have our poppy seed filling. This is light wrapped around darkness. This is the act of creation understood not just uh, in religion, but science as well. This calls back to Genesis chapter one, uh, where the universe is founded, the, the Hamantaschen is Hamantaschen is a symbol of the universe itself. Uh, to make a Hamantaschen, we take a circular piece of dough though, a universal symbol, and we fold it into a triangle, a shape that's finite and particular. Yeah, that's what it is. In addition, uh, the poppy that's seeds inside, as they should be for a Hamantaschen, they're a compelling choice. They're sweet. The seeds represent the prospect of new life. But poppy seeds, as we all know, have some, some darker symbolism as well, uh, pain relief, risk of addiction, dependence. In some ways, they represent the potential loss of free will, one of the challenges of human ethics and morality. Hamantaschen are a symbol of humanity. Uh, they're cloaked in good, if occasionally dry, but uh, good intentions, good actions. But how do we deal with what lies inside, what lies in our own hearts? In order to understand Hamantaschen, I think we need to really understand what they represent. Um, this requires an exegesis of the key text from Forum. Uh, one second, exegesis? Exegesis <laughs> um, of the, the key text. Now, it would be easy to go to the, the Megillah, the book of Esther, um, but I think that's been done before. I wanna go to a slightly less thoroughly studied text, but one that's just as central um, to our, our Forum experience. My hat, it has three corners. 
Now, this brings up four key points. My, hat, three, and corners. I think we can find out something by, by judging them each in turn. The my is kind of strange, as mentioned previously. My, in this case, is Haman's. And I know some of you are mentally groggering as, as you listen to this. Um, it's a little bit strange, honestly, still. Um, it's tempting uh, to say that uh, we commemorate our oppressor who to remember the harm that was uh, intended for us. But this is unusual among Jewish celebrations. We typically remember the harm done to us on the, the, the sadder, uh, more melancholy events on the Jewish calendar. Um, holidays are usually festive by nature. Um, uh, so let us actually consult another famous text. Uh, why is it my, not his, not your, not their, why my? Um, let's go back to the, the famous point that uh, on Purim, a person is obligated in theory to get so drunk that they don't know the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordecai. Now, this is more than just some kind of Kabbalistic point. Uh, if we go back as mentioned to the book of Esther, and if I may uh, steal a point from the uh, parents of my daughter's best friend at Sinai, uh, who kind of inspired this discussion, um, it is a little uh, unnerving that towards the end of the forum story, the Jews go out and slay 75,000 people. And then on the next day, we have a day of feasting and gladness. Um, this is a, a, a story that when we consider, if we say that Mordecai and Cayman are getting confused, in part, it's probably in part because they're not always quite so different. In the end, it comes down to which is ours and which is theirs and who is in power at any given time. Uh, one of the, the faults of human experience is that no matter how righteous you feel, when put in a position of power, uh, that can corrupt just about anybody. Uh, as uh, a survey of the headlines from this past Saturday when I was writing this talk um, might otherwise indicate, sometimes we and they are not so very different. Um, it's just uh, who's in control. Let's move to the hat. What does the hat represent? Uh, a hat quite literally in, often involves the fear of God, the act of God watching over us. Famously though, there's no mention of God in the book of Esther. It's a human story alone. Um, let's look at a text involving hats. Uh, I'll let people read this, but the key thing I love about this story is that uh, one of our great scholars was basically yelled at by his mom. And if you follow up on the rest of this passage, you'll pretty much be able to infer that at the end she said, oi, what a disappointment, he should have been a doctor. It's a good Jewish story in that sense. What is a hat? Hats help us identify with our tribe and separate us from others. Uh, this is true of red hats with kind of four words and block letters. It's true of blue hats with kind of that weird curvy NY on them. Um, this is actually one of the justifications for wearing capote. They help us separate us from, uh, from the rest of people. But hats also conceal us from one another. They separate us from our fellow men. Hats block out light. They yield shade, or to continue the metaphor, darkness for the wearer. Also, hats in theory conceal us and our actions from those looking down from above. Hats, in some sense, uh, allow us to act as people with our free will, for better or for worse. Why three? Four would have been an even number. It allows for balance and doubles pickleball. Three is odd. In, in human terms, it's fundamentally unbalanced. Think of actions involving three people. Uh, for the card players out there, that's not euchre, that's cutthroat euchre. Uh, we talk about love triangles. We talk about third wheels. There is absolutely zero way you will get me to involve any expressions in French, though you might be thinking about those as well. The Purim story is fundamentally one of unstable relationships. Uh, Ahasuerus, Vashti, and the courtiers. In all of these different cases, power shifts and, and moves around depending on which pair is in control at any given time. Ahasuerus, Haman, and Esther 
is at the heart of the Purim story, as is Esther, Mordecai, and Haman, or Ahasuerus, Mordecai, and Haman. That whole end of the story is basically a story of royalty, Persians, and Jews, and who's on which side at any given time. Purim is a cautionary tale about power. It's not a story of right and wrong. It's a story about light and darkness intermingled, being in and out of power, the actions we take and their consequences. So why corners? What are corners? Circles have no corners. Latkes, hopefully, have no corners. They're continuous and go around forever. They're like time and God and law and order and its following series. Corners are sharp. They represent a change in direction. They capture the dynamism of human existence. They're the literal turning points in our fate. Corners bring different sides together into union. They delineate separations between inside and outside uh, for us individuals and uh, collectively as a people. They often host delis, which has nothing to do with any argument I want to make, but I'm trying a dirty trick by just showing a picture of a deli and trying to engender warm feelings in the audience, uh, because why not? To conclude, latkes are admittedly an excellent delivery mechanism for applesauce, as I learned again tonight. Um, but they're also basically the symbol of a story that none of us really believe in, or at least have a lot of skepticism about, for a holiday that's basically chosen for serendipitous seasonality and very little else. Hamantaschen are a symbol, hopefully I've convinced you, of all that makes us human and defines us as a people, uh, baked at 350 degrees for about 15 minutes. They're a warning, a promise, a reminder of our history and our traditions, and they're delicious. Dr. Faber, thank you so much. I must tell you though that, as many of you know, um, I spent much of my career as a social worker and I always like to tell people, I did not become a social worker because I like people because I really don't. I became a social worker because I'm really bad at math. So when you started with math, you lost me. But when you brought the picture of the deli in, I, I was back in the story. Thank you so much. That really drew me back in. So Dr. Faber and Dr. Bissonette, any last thoughts, rebuttals, additions, deletions to your very, very cogent, interesting, bit tangential arguments. I, I think uh, both of these uh, speaking points just made me hungry to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Very much so, very much so. Well, before, before I ask our audience to vote on which culinary treat they most prefer, I would like to share one last piece of information. And I'm going to show you a short video from somebody that many of us have a great deal of trust for. He is a learned man, a wise man. He is um, admittedly not a member of our synagogue, nor a member of our tribe. But a couple of years ago, he was invited to weigh in at another Latka Hamantash debate. And I found this video and I thought this is a wonderful, would be a wonderful way to bring our Temple Sinai debate to a close. So I'll give me a moment here while I share my screen. Warm greetings to you all. My name is Tony Fauci, and I'm the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. I would like to thank Rabbi Rudolph and my colleague, David Margulies, for this opportunity to meet with you virtually. I am delighted to weigh in on this year's debate at Congregation Beth El on the virtues of Laktkus versus Hamun Tashun. While my wife and I enjoy both of these traditional foods, my vote is for lakkus. 
with applesauce or sour cream, preferably sour cream. I wish all of you a happy Hanukkah and please continue to wear a mask, stay safe and keep well. Who better than our own Dr. Fauci to weigh in on this debate? And his pronunciation of the two delicacies. Mm. Wonderful. All right, so I am, ladies and gentlemen of Temple Sinai, going to put up a poll and you are all invited to weigh in on Hamantashtin or Latka. <laughs> and if for some reason, depending upon the machine you're on, you can't see the poll, let me know and you can weigh in by your hand up or just speaking out or putting it in chat. I'm waiting for two other folks. Dr. Faber, thank you so much. He's going to vote for whoever I vote for. Okay. It is a resounding, resounding. The winner are the latkes. So I welcome everybody to unmute and share any of your own personal thoughts, reactions to our conversation this evening, how you in your own world came to down on one side or the other. Well, I would just like to say that um, while I concur with the Latkes, very enthusiastically, I know that we are divided between applesauce and sour cream. And I just want to mention that, although I know some people here tonight will not agree, it's sour cream all the way. Mm, no, uh, maybe that's next year's debate, Marlene. <laughs> applesauce, applesauce, applesauce. Sour cream with a little bit of sugar and honey. Oh, Mr. Fenster. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> From the guy who sells honey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Oh, my gosh. I think it depends on what you're eating it with. Because if you're eating it with meat, then you probably shouldn't be having sour cream if you... Pay attention to that stuff. <laughs> Renee, Renee, this is a no judgment zone. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, right. There you go. So you can't eat it with shrimp scampi then? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. always an exception. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Speaking as a Bostonian, I have. Okay. Anyway. Any other thoughts around the table on the debate? On which um, food? Go ahead, there, Dr. There is a restaurant at Disney World that has, uh, it's a whole Jewish themed restaurant that has latkes topped with lox. And while those are both particularly good Jewish foods, it seems a little much, like for one plate, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I've seen it like, it, it, like bar mitzvahs and weddings, like hors d'oeuvres, with all kinds of mm -hmm. the wrong stuff on them. Mm -hmm. I think we have to go traditional. I just want to say I really appreciate this this well researched and presented mm -hmm. scholarly debate by these two esteemed yes. uh, panelists uh, presenters. Yes, very much so. <laughs> very much. They did. So. They covered all the angles. Really. All right. Especially Josh. Especially Josh. I was going to yeah. say that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. I would yeah. like to make one more point about latkes. Go can, ahead. You can get them any time of the year. You can get them in a restaurant. Hamantaschen, really? Yeah. So can I ask, I want to ask everybody a question. When I was growing up, the Hamantaschen 
we had were not like cookies. They were more like um like bread. They were poppy seed or prune, uh-huh. but they weren't cookies. They were more like a pastry. And and we got them here in Rochester. So mm. so it's very different now that I see the ones that are cookies. I don't remember it being anything other than a cookie. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah so- yeah, my sister said we were just having this conversation, mm-hmm. and my sister said she likes the softer kind, mm-hmm. and so she must be able to get those in Buffalo. Well, but quality quality bakery. Remember quality bakery? Yeah. Or both, any of you who've been here for a long time, they always yeah. made the soft kind. It wasn't until we had yeah. Molex that they made the cookie. Oh. Mm-hmm. I I would guarantee you, my grandmother was buying them at the quality. Probably. And because also, was, you didn't know what life. was inside. That never showed you what was inside. It was always a mystery. You could have ended <laughs> right. up with prune, even though you thought it would be oh, yeah. something else. That's right. That was very tricky. Oh, and mm-hmm. as a Bostonian who doesn't know from Quality Bakery, I will say ours were like soft. And mm-hmm. I like the cookies. I'm very pleased with the cookies. Mm-hmm. But of course, we all also have thin pizza. So what can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, when our kids were younger, and we belonged to a Habara, you know, because we had those in the temple for a while. Um, and everybody had kids, you know, of varying ages. We used to get together and do hamantash and baking um, every year. And we used Robin Schifrin's dough recipe, which is still my go to recipe if I ever have to make hamantash. Um, like I had to give the recipe to somebody last year. I remember somebody was asking me for a recipe. And um, we used to fill it with all kinds of stuff, including chocolate, you know, because nobody wanted to eat poppy seeds or prunes. Blah. That's why I, growing up, I didn't really like hamantash because that's all we had was poppy seeds and prunes, neither of which would go into my stomach, you know? No apricot? <laughs> I was going to say apricot was the best. We didn't have apricot. I think Today, maybe that's because that's what my mother bought. <laughs> is is that the recipe to, with orange? Point... Mm, sorry, go ahead. Is that the recipe with a little bit of orange juice in it? Mm-hmm. Okay. The best. But I want to yeah. point out, Renee, that when you said about making them, you said when 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 I have to make comatash. No one ever says when I have to make latkes. Everybody's <laughs> excited. My husband does. That's true. I love <laughs> making latkes. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, we, thank you for having this. <laughs> we will great. we will find our learned mm-hmm. debaters for next year and have them start working now on yeah. their presentations. Um and we will uh, we'll pick this up this time next year. And uh, Adult Ed would like to thank everyone for coming and cordially invite you to our upcoming Sephardic Mizrahi weekend, the 17th through the 19th, which also involves a lot of food and new food sensations, including Shabbat service with Onig, delish, a film on Saturday, Mizrahi snacks, and intergenerational cooking on Sunday at noon-ish and hope to see you all there. And thank you so much for coming out or in tonight. Let's thank Keith too. Thanks, Thank Keith. you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Keith. Thanks thank for you. being here. Thanks, Josh and Melissa, especially. That was a lot of work. Yeah. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.